Coming up on the Civil Discourse, eminent historian Jay Winter will discuss his work on war, memory, the changing representation of war in words and images, and what it means to be a moral witness. The problem with representing war is that all what I would call conventional languages fail. They simply do not have the capacity to convey the cognitive dissonance of people trapped in the midst of a field of force much bigger than they are and into a world of violence. Hello and welcome to the Civil Discourse. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohn, Dean of the Pannoni Honors College at Drexel University, speaking to you from my home in Center City, Philadelphia. Today, my guest is Jay Winter, the Charles J. Still Emeritus Professor of History at Yale University. Professor Winter is the author of dozens of books, edited volumes, articles, and book chapters dealing with war and memory. He was co-producer, co-writer, and chief historian for the award-winning PBS BBC series, The Great War and the Shaping of the 20th Century. I am honored to have him here today, joining us from Paris, my favorite city, to speak about his work. Jay Winter, welcome to the Civil Discourse. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, you've spent your career, for the most part, focused on World War I the so-called Great War. And I wonder to begin, what drew you to that war, to study that war in such depth, and what distinguished it, in your opinion, from previous wars, and perhaps even from all other wars since then? Well, when I began my, my work as a historian in the 1960s, it occurred to me that the Vietnam War, then reaching its, shall we say, ascendancy as a disaster, um, resembled no war that I knew of better than the First World War. So the First World War was, was in, in some ways a, a disaster, a trauma for European societies that the United States was, was in the middle of when I, was, when I was an undergraduate. The second reason that I focused on the First World War, which by, at that time was not a major historical subject in, um, in European history, um, was that my, my family are Holocaust survivors and the Holocaust is simply too terrifying a subject to approach directly. So I tried to act the way um, the Greek poet Kafavi says, to look at the world at a, at a tangent and approach not the Holocaust, which wiped out my mother's family in Warsaw, but to go to its antechamber, to approach that war that made Auschwitz thinkable, possible, um, doable rather than directly to enter into a set of memories of my childhood that are still painful uh, and, and difficult. It, it was as if the first world was a way of circling around a black hole, uh, not only in my life, but in the life of the Jewish people as a whole. And instead of being trapped by its magnetic field and sucked into it, uh, I was able to keep my distance um, most of my life. I've been able to keep my distance from it and, and to study the first world war. That is fascinating. And um, those two oblique entryways from the Vietnam War, which was your contemporary event, and then the Holocaust is fascinating to me. And it also reminds me of someone, I interviewed Paul Bussell. I know that you have just written an introduction to his great book, The Great War and Modern Memory. And for him, it was similar because his experience in World War II, I believe, led him to explore World War I and with the same basic rationale that the horrors of that war for him being immersed in it were too great and the indirection was needed. Could you tell us a little bit about Fussell as you see his work and how, as he may have inspired you? Because I was very moved because he was already very sick when I interviewed him. And he was not articulate until he got on certain subjects 
And then it was as though his debility lifted and he spoke with such eloquence about what had happened to him during World War II. It, it remains with me to this day. Well, I still miss uh, Paul Fussell. He was a friend and a colleague whose work I think is extraordinary. It really created the field of the cultural history of the First World War. Of course, not alone. No one ever does that alone. Um, but I, I met Paul Fussell in Germany and found him fascinating because we would be driving uh, to a small town called Siegen for uh, a conference with another great historian, George Mossy. And I watched Paul Fussell look out the window and then asked him what he's he looking at or for. And he's saying he's looking he's looking for the best place to put anti-tank guns. Uh, and the reason was he had learned about topography when he was a junior officer in the Second World War um, and had been imprinted by that experience, in part also because he had an absolutely extraordinary guide who was a sergeant, a professional soldier, who told him what to do every day, literally what to do from the first time an officer gets up in the morning because the lives of his unit depend on him. And that man... Um, died in the Battle of the Blitz. And I believe that uh, Paul never recovered from that, from that loss. He died, I think, next to him. Yes, he learned viscerally the meaning uh, of, of irony, which is why was it that the uh, fragment of a shell hit the sergeant next to him and not him? Why? These existential puzzles that can never be sorted out started him in the direction of the 18th century English ironists and then the 20th century trench poets. I, I hadn't made that connection that the irony is what led him to do to write his first book on 18th century literature, which was his original uh, area of expertise. Can you talk a little bit, and you've just uh, we've just discussed it a bit, the disconnect between this, and you've written about this, a society's representation of war and the reality of war by of those who were immersed in it or who felt its effects directly. The problem with uh, representing war is that all what I would call conventional languages fail. They simply do not have the capacity to convey the cognitive dissonance of people trapped in the midst of a field of force much bigger than they are and into a world of violence. So that language almost always um, trails behind experience. And when that experience goes into areas where language can't go, um, there are ways people handle it. One way is, is through silence. And I think silence is a language of memory and an important one. But another way is to try to rest to new uses, the languages they've got at their disposal. Um, the uh, the Hebrew poet uh, Yehuda Amichai was brilliant at this because he took Old Testament and biblical usage and he turned them, again, ir ironically, inside out. He was a, a very remarkable poet who took language in directions that started with what I would call the most ancient and turned, turned the most ancient into the carrier of, of the most modern. And I, I think that's what Paul Fussell showed in The Great War in Modern Memory. Well, it's interesting your point that um people use language creatively to try and approach this, but they also use it platitudinously, so to speak, to flatten it and to comfort themselves. And I wonder if you'll, I know that you've, you've mentioned that and it does a disservice or worse than that to the experience as it happened. Most conventional, in other words, most of the um, language that people learn about what war is, um, when they get into the experience is totally and completely useless. Um, that I think is, is one reason why a number of writers about, about Vietnam say that the only truth about war is lies because lies shock, they undermine a sense of, of orientation about uh, uh, the credentials of the speaker. Uh, we all have a social con contract, including in this uh, conversation uh, that we're telling the truth. Of course, this is a convention. In wartime, the only way to tell the truth is to go beyond the conventional language of a, of, a, of a period and to move elsewhere, move in some direction that people hadn't been before. Uh, and frequently, that shock uh, of, uh, of the uh, unsayable um, is also a matter of uh, the existential problems of 
20th century warfare, which is dealing not just with the, the landscape of violence, but with the phenomenon of mass death. Um, between, let's say, the middle of the 18th century and 1914, uh, death rates in most European countries uh, went down substantially so that most people by 1900 could have as many children as they want and to stay alive for the rest of their lives. They knew what their families were. That wasn't true 150 years before. But the mass death of the young was going out of style because of the great improvements in living standards and medical care and uh, health administration like clean water and, uh, and sewage disposal and so on. So the, the, the issue of, of war uh, providing uh, an experience that we're now in this COVID uh, epidemic uh, returning to, the experience of mass death is something that goes beyond conventional language. So war itself does it through uh, the uh, uh, appalling uh, ways in which uh, violence induces uh, pain that the Harvard scholar Elaine Scarry says goes beyond language. Well, I think even more than pain, um, mass death is a very, very deep challenge to the claim that that language of a colloquial kind, the language we're using today, can convey experience. You know, I've thought a lot about this because I too lost family in the Holocaust and in the pogroms before that in Russia. I wonder about, you know, the silence that occurred to, to my mind as a child growing up about World War II, about the Holocaust, um, and, and then burst forth into various forms of expression, I would say 30, 40 years ago, if that is that people found ways of approaching it or that the distance was necessary. I mean, that's something that I've, I've always been curious about. I also was told by people, and I think Hannah Arendt may have written about this indirectly, that there was a certain shame even associated with the Holocaust for those who survived and those who were in America. Have you thoughts about this? I don't share Hannah Arendt's views, um, in, in part because I don't share some of her interpretations of the responsibility that the uh, Judenrat to the Jewish committees had for the fate of the Jewish people. I think she is much, much harder on them than she was on, on her lover, Heidegger. Uh, there is a, a great yeah. difficulty in judging people who are put in an excruciating and impossible position by the Nazis who had no choice. It's not a question of good or bad choice, no choice whatsoever. And, and for my, in my mind, her, uh, her intellectual arrogance went well, well beyond her human compassion. So uh, Hannah Arendt, I don't take as a guide. I understand that. I know a lot of people felt that way then and now. I wonder if you could, uh, you gave a lecture recently, which I heard and that I thought was superb on the Holocaust survivor, Primo Levi. And I think you're very attached to his story. I don't know if you're writing about him. You had said in the lecture that it's someone that you actually avoided writing about until recently. Could you tell our audience who Primo Levi was, why you admire him so much? And, you know, he did commit suicide, didn't he? And that, what drove him to that at such a late date, mm -hmm. having survived the Holocaust? Well, Primo Levi, in my view, is, is one of the great um, moral witnesses of the 20th century. He, he's a man who conveyed, I think, to every one of us and to later generations, the notion that uh, moral thinking survived uh, the Holocaust, that it didn't leave open existential questions that grew larger and, I would say, more burdensome, uh, but brought us the, the view that comes from the Perkei Avot, you know, from, uh, from the Talmud where the instruction is, in a world where there are no human beings, be one. Primo <laughs> Levi was that man. And his writings have um, echoes, of course, in my life and the lives of many other people. But what, what I wanted to do uh, was to um, de-sanctify him. Um, there are many people who see him as a spokesman or a kind of scientific uh, distanced view of the Holocaust. And he was a chemist and worked as, uh, as a chemist most of his life. But I felt, and I still feel, uh, the anger, the anger, the outrage in his language. And it, it, it strikes me that 
um, it is a super arrogation to make claims about the power of Primo Levi's language if I'm not a master of it myself. I think it is true to say that uh, most of the scholars I've known who are great scholars have an element of modesty in what they do. Um, and uh, I want to treat the Primo Levi with the seriousness uh, that he deserves. It is uh, true after that lecture, a number of people suggested to me that uh, Italian scholars can perhaps share <laughs> the, the authorship. That, that, would be, that would be terrific. But, but what, I, what I think that is uh, astonishing uh, about his writing is the extent to which he never forgave and he never forgot. The concept of compassion as a, uh, as a, as a Christian act, which, um, by the way, some elements of the other great spokesmen uh, of the Holocaust the Holocaust, Elie Wiesel had, had the capacity to forgive is something I, I simply um, don't understand and uh, don't share. Uh, and what Primo Levi did was to establish uh, moral grounds for, um, for retaining a, a degree of anger, which is expressed most particularly in the poem he wrote separately from the book um, that I used as a, a kind of centerpiece of uh, my lecture. Suicide is an area that I think no one can really make sense of. And I, I, I deliberately said, I'm not going to speculate about his pathway there. I'm not even sure it's true. There are one particular friend in Rome, a rabbi he spoke to a few minutes before said he, he had no idea that there were these terrible forms of depression about his mother, his mother-in-law and others who had bad, poor health. There were worries about the return of um, Holocaust denial. All of those are true. But I, what I prefer to do is to say that in those last moments of his life, only he and his Lord knew what the truth is. He certainly is worth reading. And I guess the periodic table, would you say people should start with that? And then, of course, I. how, how do you translate it? I am a man. Yeah, if this be a man. I think it's if this be a man. Yeah, in Italian, it's different, but it's uh, how in the world it got tri translated into the English version of survival in Auschwitz, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you make the point that the representation of war changes um, in different periods of time. Can you give us a sketch of that? Because and, I, and I'm also curious about your another point you make that um, We've moved with modern warfare increasingly away from the representation of the individual face. Yes. Um, so these are, are issues of representation, which mm -hmm. I think are very interesting when connected with warfare. Mm -hmm. Could you contextualize them for us? Yes, I think, I think the, the most important reason why um, the face of the soldier was um, hidden, the later uh, we move into the 20th century's technology. Uh, the technology of uh, warfare changed radically. In the, in the first uh, world war, it was the first moment when the fruits of the huge industrial revolution of the late 19th century were turned into not only the metal of the, of the shells, the artillery shells, uh, but the uh, uh, explosives and the poison gas was used on the battlefield. So there, there's something about the face of a soldier being confronted by just as an example, gas warfare, where he has to put on a covering and he looks like a machine. He looks like a, an astronaut, we would say these days, but uh, in those, or a Star Wars uh, figure. But in 1914, a war was a natural event. It was a normal event. It happened in the history of virtually every country. It was an honorable event. It was waged by empires and states and having an empire was not a crime until the 1960s, not in the First World War at all. And what happens in the First World War, the the the, the the, the struggle between human beings and machines was won by the machines. So in the course of the war, the face of the individual soldier, the notion that war is something about individual activity, one man in, in combat with another, the, the way that the Iliad was, begins to disappear, radically disappear. And once the notion that war is about the mass and not the individual, then the representation of war by the individual face becomes less appropriate. We see this in the work of the German artist Otto Dix, for example. But then when the technology goes even more, as it were, distant from the individual face, we turn to the Guernica of Picasso, because what, what really matters is that we don't see death coming from the air, but it's coming from a machine that is run by electricity. And what does Picasso do brilliantly? He puts a, 
a light bulb in the middle of this um, uh, uh, painting uh, to show us that the great you know, electrical revolution, the scientific revolution celebrated by the 1937 Paris World's Fair, which is where, where this was uh, displayed for the first time, brings death as well. And it, it inspired the, the vision of uh, the German critic, Walter Benjamin, that there is no monument to civilization like electricity that is not at the same time a monument to barbarism like Guernica. And then mm. within the Second World War, that uh, use of air power obviously went as far as the atomic bomb, uh, but the use of, um, of uh, various forms of, of science, the science of chemistry and physics, led to the uh, monstrous uh, use of poison gas and, and the Holocaust. So the claim I'm making is that in the course of the 20th century, the wars get more, as it were, machine driven and less human driven to a point that it becomes a play. It becomes, it becomes COVID. War, war, in my view, is, is a mutant virus that spread through the 20th century in such a way as to make us aware that anyone who comes into contact with it is likely to be either damaged or killed. And when soldiers are no longer heroic carriers of the nation, nation's ideals, but victims of war, which is an external technologically driven matter, then I think what we can appreciate is that the 19th century heroism lying behind conventional representations of war is gone. It's dead. And, and in its place, we now are searching time and again for new ways of talking. And the very idea of heroism seems to become obsolete within. So does the, the, so does the idea of sacrifice. You know, I, I like to dwell on that word because it's an important word mm -hmm. with all of the religious inflections, all of the Christian religious in, inflections, as well as, as, well as the, the Jewish and the Muslim ones, uh, and probably others that I'm unaware of too. Um, sacrifice implies choice. If someone says, I believe this is the right thing to do, my country was attacked. 9-11 happened, we have to respond. These, these, are real, these are real issues. And in, in, my, in my sense, what happens is when people don't have a choice anymore, then the concept of sacrifice is very, very difficult. Um, in fact, it's, it's led to a very powerful, I think, a conflict within Jewish theology. But 1,500,000 Jewish children died in the Holocaust. What choice did they have? When, when choice becomes irrelevant to war, you know, what choice did people in Hiroshima have when the, the bomb was dropped? I, I, I'm not only talking about the Holocaust, but the right. Holocaust I think, is a massive right. element in this story. The notion of choice goes, and when that goes, martyrdom becomes a less powerful idea. And there are people in the Warsaw Ghetto, a brilliant man named Shimon Huberban, who uh, said that perhaps the Kiddush HaChaim, that there's a better way of sanctifying the name of the Lord is through living rather than dying. That, that is a shock, and it's not at all a view shared by everyone, but it indicates something, I think, about the power of individual words like sacrifice. You mentioned um, that people who have gone through the atrocities of war have come face to face with what Kant has called radical evil. And I can tell, speaking with you, that you're very steeped in both ethical and moral and religious uh, views of our human, our humanity. And I, I'm also struck by your earlier comment that not to forget and not to forgive, yes. which I think are interesting statements given how we're generally taught about how to face people who have done terrible things. My view is Kantian in several respects. The, the first view is that anyone who treats other people um, as objects, or as means to an end rather than ends in themselves is evil. Radical evil is a radical, or a, I would call it a system of power which inflicts on other people the status of object rather than the status of humanity. And the Nazis did that with enormous efficiency. The notion of uh, removing the, from the world of the cancer uh, of Jewish culture is as good a, a description of what Immanuel Kant found as utterly outside the boundaries of morality as, as you could, of course, Stalin. We could, we could look at many other systems who do the same. So uh, I, I am a Kantian in some important ways. And you realize that Kant is one of those great philosophers who didn't depend on religious belief in order to generate his moral system. Mm. Yes, this wonderful statement saying that uh, 
the only things that really bring me awe are the stars above and the, and the moral order within. Uh, that that's a powerful statement and one I one I I, I cling to in uh, some moments where conventional um, uh, Jewish thinking in which I was raised doesn't seem to have any answers. And by the way, I want to insist upon that that the the Jewish theological dilemma over the Holocaust is with us radically with us still, and it will be with our children and our grandchildren for a long, long time. I really want to thank you for taking the time from your wonderful life in Paris to talk with me about subjects that are of such depth and such importance, I think, as you say, to us, to our children and to our children's children. So thank you, Jay Winter, for being with us today. I'm very happy that you gave me the chance to speak. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for joining us today at the Civil Discourse. Thank you.